this was a very fortunate opportunity to make something that is not in a place where you expect to see art. To be in a train station is, is for me, is the, the best. And the experience of seeing art in your daily life is very rewarding too, because it, sometimes, it, you know, you just look at something and you smile. And it's something different than what you do all the time. Like, see, they would do these two panels. It is the largest permanent public art installation in New York, all displayed at the city's newest subway line. With each station being two and three blocks long, there's nothing really like it in magnitude in Manhattan. The Statue of Liberty is tall, but it's not as tall as all these stations combined. Four art installations have been commissioned, one for each of the new stations. On 72nd Street, Perfect Strangers by the Brazilian artist Vic Muniz. A series of 36 life-size portraits of New Yorkers. People who you find in that picture, they are just people who are real. That's my daughter, by the way. A few of them play some characters based on what they wanted to be. But they were people who were close to me. These two guys work, you know, in my house. My wife and my baby. And you always see mothers like carrying lots of things. It's pretty heroic. That's Gaspar, my son. A number of people that are in Times Square, they put like mascot clothes to take pictures with tourists. And that's, that's what they do the whole day. It's just like one of these guys coming back home after a, a long day of work. Thick Muniz lives and works between Rio de Janeiro and New York City. Rio is a very interesting uh, city. It's very similar to New York because it's a city that's very permeable. You know, you can, you can meet different people. Uh, all you have to do is to be out there and, and, and interact. You know? Rio is a, is a huge city and still we have a, the biggest urban forest in the world. I live in the forest, 10 minutes uh, walking distance from the beach. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Vic grew up with next to nothing in Sao Paulo. When I was very young, we lived in a very small house, in a skid row in a very poor neighborhood of Sao Paulo, and I stayed most of my days with my grandmother. My grandmother was a very interesting person. She, she was from a time that women did not attend school in the countryside, but she taught herself how to read. And she taught me how to read the way she taught herself how to read which was by memorizing the entire shapes of the words. By the time I entered school, I was already reading chapter books, uh, but I could not write a single sentence of my own. When I was taking dictation, the teacher would tell me a word that I didn't know how to write or make a little drawing. My copy books looked like hieroglyphs or Chinese characters. There were signs that I could only understand what it was, but I could read them. When his teacher saw his drawing, she soon recognized his talent. Vic was sent to an arts festival where he won a scholarship to learn academic drawing. For a 14-year-old to spend the entire afternoon drawing naked people, it was amazing. You know? <laughs> I didn't miss a class uh, and, and I, I, I started becoming very interested in why uh, we see things in pictures and what, what, what are the really the psychological uh, you know, mechanisms that enables us to see uh, or to experience representation. After school, Vic started working in advertising. He developed a system to improve the readability of billboards and won another award. And that led to a life-changing moment. The day I went to pick up this trophy, I rented a tuxedo for the first time in my life. I went there, had a beer, received the thing, said thank you. And I just left because I didn't know anybody. A woman stopped the car and she said, you know, you have to help me. Somebody's killing my fiance. So I got out of the car and there were indeed two people fighting. They're dressed in, they're all wearing tuxedos. It looked like a James Bond scene, <laughs> you know. And one guy was hitting the other with brass knuckles, you know. So I pushed the, the aggressor and he ran away. And I said, okay, okay. And I just, you know, proceeded to my car. Well, the victim, you know, went to his car, picked up a gun, and decided to shoot the first person wearing a tuxedo. But I was on my way to my car, I heard an explosion, I was on the floor, and I looked back and I saw this guy just shooting at me. And I went to the car, 
and, uh, and I, went, I managed to get to the hospital. Luckily, you know, it was in the leg, wasn't fatal, and, and even more luckily, the guy was rich. So he offered to pay for all the medical bills, and he bribed me uh, with some money not to, to press charges, you know. And it was with this money that I bought a ticket to come to the United States. I arrived in New York in 83, and uh, it took me four years, you know, before I could become an artist. So I started working as an artist. So I started first showing small nonprofit uh, group shows until I got a gallery to represent me. My first show was in 88. Around 91, I came to Brazil. All of a sudden, I'm having exhibitions in Brazil. Collectors are by. It's a different kind of people that I'm. Uh, dealing with professionally, you know, and, uh, and my parents are very humble people. They're very, you know, they come, none of them ever been really to school, and then they, I see them completely ostracized, very, you know, uh, set aside from that world of somewhat glamorous, which is, uh, you know, the world of contemporary art. That bothered me, deeply bothered me. I, I couldn't really put these two things together. My the reality of my being here in Brazil as a poor kid, and then this person who come back and now deals with art collectors who spend, you know, a sizable amount of money in things that are don't have any specific use. You know, I was invited to do a project in Salvador with homeless kids for uh, an NGO called Projeto Axé. I worked for four months uh, with kids from the street. And I had so much pleasure doing it. So I've always been engaged in social projects since. A lot of the ideas start like this. You don't know where you're getting. It's just more like a, a feeling, a sensation, you know? When you look at a picture of chalk, you think about that, the way you touch it, the noise it makes on the, on the blackboard. So I want to do a picture where we take a picture of this and then we cut and do something on top. But I don't know what it is, but I have to start somewhere. Vic incorporates everyday materials into his artwork. Tufts of cotton wool become clouds. He's made portraits with sugar, dirt, dust, even chocolate syrup. He's also created pictures with garbage, which led to him becoming the subject of the acclaimed documentary Wasteland in 2010. The materials, people say, well, uh, you work with so many things, with chocolate, with uh, honey, with uh, nails, with gold, diamonds, with, uh, garbage. The real material is experience, you know. I choose to work with uh, unorthodox uh, materials because that sets me in a way to, to develop different processes and different approaches, conceptual approaches towards the, what I'm trying to achieve. For me, more important than creating pictures is creating process to make pictures. Because when people look at my work, I want them to look at it and imagine how that thing was made. If you have very interesting processes, you know, to get to something, that discovery, that, that, you know, that inquiry into the process becomes more fruitful. People get very, they say, oh, God, he did it like, oh, that's how he did it, you know? But it's still very awkward, you know? Most people do this, they go to, to see an image, they go, like, they go like this, you know? And what they do by going back and forth is actually realizing the extent of that magic. Because at a certain distance, you see the image. If you get closer, you see what the image is made of. When the New York subway fell into disrepair in the 1980s, the city's transport authority, the MTA, decided to commission artwork when rebuilding the stations. It was an innovative way of making the whole system more inviting. People glamorize the days of graffiti and leaky stations, but it was a little frightening for the everyday rider. Art is part of what brought them back, and now people expect to see art when their stations are renovated. The system's over 100 years old, so we're constantly renovating stations. Here we were able to build new stations. This new Second Avenue subway line has been in the planning since the 1920s. It was finally opened to the public on January the 1st, 2017. 
Now 150,000 people a day use its four new stations, a captive audience for this art exhibition. If you have a gallery show, you might get a few thousand people every day, and here you get many times more every day for a hundred years, as long as the station lasts. At 96th Street, Sarah C., who makes these very intricate sculptures, she's dealing with how you look at things in three dimensions, how you depict speed and space and motion. She was very ambitious, decided she would use all of the wall tile. And we counted, there's 4,400 pieces of tile. At 63rd Street, Jean Shin sort of mines the local history and looked at archives of photographs from when there was an elevated train which was being demolished to make way for the Second Avenue subway. 86th Street, Chuck Close, whose career has been built on looking at how you can depict the human face. So here he has 12 mosaics that are composed in different techniques that mimic the printing process, but it's hand-painted tile, it's intricate 200,000 pieces of glass, and he wanted to represent New Yorkers, so among his circle of cultural figures and artists and family members. Being close to, to Chuck in this line, for me, was, I thought it was very interesting because, of, you know, I guess the writer would have, uh, you'd be able to, to you know, to think of image making in different ways. We're very similar because we're about like creating ways of making pictures, you know. He's very methodic. I'm a little bit more empirical, messy, but uh, I, I think it's very complementary. In his project, as much as in mine, there was a great deal of research trying to find the right way to use mosaic. In my case, I wanted something that, um, probably he wanted that too. You'd be like more on a photorealistic verge but it wouldn't be representing just a picture. It would also be representing the act of putting little pieces of glass together. So we wanted both of it, a meta mosaic, if I may say, something that would make people wonder about how these things are actually put together. Working at the, at the subway stations, it's, it was not very difficult because I've always been working you know, with sort of mosaics. You see, there's many ways to do a mosaic. Um, uh, you can do them with real pieces of glass, like the ones that are in the station. And then there are other techniques that involve, uh, you know, ceramics. So you actually make, you print on ceramics a photograph and you just, dis you just put them back together. All of the pieces that are in the subway station were manufactured in Germany with a team of Italian artisans. They do a lot of classic work. And for them, it was very exciting to work on a project that uh, evolved uh, like a very traditional, very ancient technique, making a contemporary subject. It's actually bringing and updating all that technique into a, a context that's very contemporary. That's me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I was going to show my portfolio at MoMA, and that thing happened to me with the portfolio of pictures. It was too autobiographical if I had the pictures, so I, I made a, a businessman with a suitcase with the papers. And I dropped all my photographs in the subway. And we were touching them, and I kind of felt bad. So... They're very resilient. They're very, very, they'll be here for a while. This was very challenging because making balloons out of pieces of glass sounds like a really crazy project, but um, they are so accomplished, you know, from across, the, you, they really feel round and pop. I like how he really captured lots of different ethnicities and different people just looking like they're going to work or doing their shopping or running their errands. It's very beautiful. I love that they use the tile mosaic. You get different, different hues, different shades, and the luster on it. I walk down here just to see the art. One thing is really cool, you can see people who are actually rushing to get somewhere. And all of a sudden, they, from the corner of the eye, they pick up something, stop, and they go there and they put the finger on and do that kind of thing. To see people really relate, line up to take photographs. New Year's Day when it opened, it was a long holiday weekend, and all of New York came to see this new public work. 
it makes the difference between a library with no books and with books. It's like having artwork in a public space. It's really what New York is about, so we're very happy with the work. I'm like so honored, you know, uh, and I, I feel very lucky, you know. I'm sure there were projects that were really great. The reason why mine was chosen, you know, it beats me, but um, I, I can, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually make artwork that is permanent and that's going to be seen by this, this number of people every day. You know.